important. And then he'll carefully include some more states and make sure that the results don't change too much. Here's an interesting experimental assignment. These experiments are tough. It turns out that when you put a molecule in the gas phase, there are not many of them, and they don't absorb much IR radiation. And so it's really hard to do a direct IR absorption. So one of the famous techniques, and, and Mark um, Johnson has really pushed this idea, and Etienne Garan, my colleague, has also been working on it quite a bit, is you put an argon in. And the reason you're doing this is that this is a charged species. And so you could put it in a mass spec, and you could be sitting there as you, as you produce this in a nozzle, and, and you could collect this species in a mass spec. But you could also collect the tag species in a mass spec. And, and the beauty of a mass spec is you, you, count, you can count almost individual molecules as they arrive at your, at your detector in the mass spec. And then what you do is when you excite a vibration, the assumption is that energy is enough that the energy will flow through the molecule in some sort of statistical way. And, and when that energy gets over into this part of the molecule, it breaks the chemical bond. So this is photo-induced chemistry, and, and you have energy flow in the molecule. But when you think about the lifetimes of this, these lifetimes are much longer than the ones that we're seeing in the experiment, so they're irrelevant. So for the experiment to work, you have to have complete energy flow. But for the experiment to work at some short time scale, that has to be irrelevant. It's a subtle point, but it's a really beautiful part about these experiments. Now, here's some nuts and bolts. We need these cubic terms. Where do they come from? Well, basically, what you have to do is you use Gaussian. You minimize, you find the equilibrium structure. and It has some potential about it. Because it's the equilibrium structure, there's no forces. And so when you do a Taylor series expansion about that minimum, you will find that you get some quadratic terms. Now, this term for some kind of methods can be calculated analytically, but you know, if nothing else, you could imagine that if you wanted to calculate a second derivative of some particular bond stretch or something like that, you could simply do a calculation and use finite differences where you extend the bond a bit, contract the bond a bit, and then use your fundamental equations of, of, of derivatives in order to extract these, these terms. So he would get these terms. And then he does a transformation to the normal coordinates. So he's doing a rotation. So he gets rid of all of the cross terms. And then he says, well, there are these cubic terms. I better calculate these cubic terms. And, and not just Gerlach, but everyone would do this. You calculate the cubic term. And immediately, you see one of the problems is that there are a lot of these terms. If you have 20 degrees of freedom, you know, you've got 20 times 20 times 20. And if you want to calculate a cross term by finite differences, you have to calculate eight calculations. So it's a lot of calculations to be able to calculate these cubic terms. You're not telling you about the Morse oscillator before. You know, to get the right hand harmonicity, you really need fourth order terms. And this, for big molecules, this rapidly um, just becomes too complex. You get too many terms. Now, when you're doing this, you're solving the electronic shortening equation. So what you're going to do is you're going to Restrict this to fourth order. You're going to say, ah, that's okay, that's probably enough, unless I do something else that I'll tell you about in a minute. And then, then you go and, and you say, well, you know, my friends are using Gaussian, I'm going to use Gaussian. And you, you look at the various different methods. And what I always do is, because I'm not an expert at this, I go and find out what other experts in the field are using to do their calculations. And for example, Jeremiah does this. This is, this is almost the gold standard. Um, if he had used triple zeta, then you'd say it was the gold standard. And, and you know, so I, I always use CCT um, with iterated triples, so I'd have a bunch of CT, and then you, and you use this level of theory. And it turns out this is slow. He has lots of computing power. And in fact, it's so slow that even with all of his computing power, he's only going to use it to calculate these particular terms. These terms are the ones that are most the energies are most sensitive to these. These terms are the ones that are causing the corrections. And so what he will do is he uses a split method. Nick Handy, back in the 80s, suggested doing this. 
He said, you, you have to do this. You want to calculate these at a lower level because there's so many terms. You want to use a simpler level theory. This is still pretty slow. Um, but, but what he, Joe, I really wants to do is he wants to be able to calculate the spectrum without any adjusted parameters. He wants to be able to do a really honest calculation. And when you do that, you need big basis sets. Actually, these are both the same basis sets, just different levels of theory. <clears throat> now, one of the, the, the problems with this method that people often run into is shown in this particular picture. What I'm showing you here is a Morse potential. So this is just the simple Morse potential that I have written down. And I'm gonna tailor series expand it for you. I'm gonna show you what it looks like when you get the quadratic expansion. You can see that there's a, there's a huge, um, very quickly you get big discrepancies that the Morse oscillator is softer on this side and it is harder on this side. And so this tells you that you need a cubic term and so V3 is my cubic term. You can see that when I add the cubic term, I've done a much, much better job at representing the potential. Usually that's not enough though. So you have to go to the quartic term and, and the quartic term is what kills it. It just really does a very nice job. But you should also note that in this particular Morse oscillator, I'm doing it in terms of the dissociation energy. So you know, right about here, we're 0.15 or 0.2 the way up the dissociation energy. So this is pretty low in energy. And if you actually went to higher energies, you realize that you have to be very careful with these potentials because cubic terms have this unfortunate behavior that they go to negative infinity in one direction and infinity in the other direction. And if you're not careful, you, you have to uh, make sure that if you have a cubic term, there's always some quartic term over here that's gonna counterbalance it. But when you have these high level expansions, you could always have some term that might be linear in one degree of freedom and quadratic in the other. And anytime you have something that's odd, any odd power, it has the possibility to put a hole in your potential somewhere in this multi-dimensional surface. Um, you would have some kind of behavior like this. And people actually write papers on this. This is just last year. Um, because people are having, as they use these methods, they, they find out that um, they do their expansions, they start doing their big, trying to solve the nuclear Schrodinger equation and their energies just keep going down and down and down. And it's because they found a hole. And so you have to be careful when you use these cubic and quartic potentials that you can have holes. Well, we have to represent the potential. And so there's, there's another way that one does this. <clears throat> I think Joel Bowman was one of the first people to do this, but it's a pretty standard technique. What you say is, I'm gonna think about my potential in the following way. He's gonna do this in terms of, these are normal coordinates here. He's gonna say, I have one body terms. And so this is, a, this is a term that only depends on Q1. This term could have Linear, a quadratic, a cubic. This could be a Morse oscillator. So this, you could make it put as many terms as you want. And then you have two body terms over here. And you could treat them as accurately as you want. You could have three body terms and so forth. And depending on, sometimes people will say you need to go up to five body terms. It depends on the accuracy you want. And it depends on your choice of normal coordinates or internal coordinates. But you need a certain number of, you, you, you Think about the potential in this particular way. And then you're gonna do each of these individual ones at a high level of theory. And you hope you get better convergence this way. So this is a very common way of doing it. And, and when you're doing these expansions, you can get away from a normal mode type expansion. You don't have to do a normal mode. You could do some other kind of expansion. Here's a simple example. When I was first playing around with these ideas, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I took eight points. And basically, I added a Gaussian at each of these points. I made the width pretty big. And I said, well, I want the, these Gaussians. I want to take a linear combination of these Gaussians so that I match all of these points. And, and so you, Ned, you can do really well when you do something like that with these. Sorry, points. sorry, Ned. Sorry. Um, there's a question by Watsal Trivedi. Watsal, could you unmute yourself? Uh, can, you, can you please go to the previous slide? Sure. Um, more? 
um yeah yeah this one so uh, i i could not understand um how what what is the how is the connection made from the taylor expansion of the mohs potential to the concept of holes so what are these holes here i mean how, how are they related to the taylor expansion imagine imagine that you um imagine that you you're trying to solve a schrodinger equation and it has a potential that looks like v3 so imagine that's your potential that so you don't know that the potential looks like but you've done an expansion and you have a cubic term that happens to look like this then what happens is when you when you do a variational calculation when you're trying to to really calculate the eigenstates of this system the minimum is over here and so all of your probability starts to build up over here because of this this the fact that the cubic term in the potential expansion is going to negative infinity as you stretch the bond and this is only an artifact of the fact that you just used a cubic term. So you'd say, well, okay, no, I would always use a, a quartic term. And if you, if you have a quartic potential, you're always safe. There can't be a hole. So a hole is this, this place over here where you fall into because the potential went to negative infinity. And if you have a quartic potential, you will always be bound and everything will look pretty well behaved. But if you think about a, a quartic expansion, there could be a term that goes as Q1 times Q2 cubed. And because that's a nice quartic term, but it's still Q2 cubed, what happens is that term can go to plus or minus infinity if, if you expand the potential too much in any one direction. So the idea is if you take one of these potential expansions that I'm showing you, up here, lots of times, if you move off in one of the directions of, of these particular S's, you find the potential goes to negative infinity. That's what I call a hole. And, and when it turns out people produce potentials all the time. Somebody does the variational calculation very carefully and after tons and tons of work, they keep seeing their energy levels go down and down and down. And it's because instead of modeling this region as they had hoped, they start modeling this region. Did that, okay. did that answer your question? Yes, 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 thank you. So the idea is to have very accurate potentials on making sure that in V1, V2, V3, you don't have any of these holes. Now, <clears throat> When one is talking about representing potentials, you know, over here, I did it as a linear combination of Gaussian functions. A more popular approach is it's called a discrete variable representation. And, and this is one of the most powerful methods in solving the nuclear Schrodinger equation. So I'm, I'm gonna take some time and I'm gonna explain it to you because I, I think it's really useful that, that you can understand what this approach is. Let's step back first remind you that you know what you always do is you pick a basis and this could be a normal mode basis and then you know somebody asked this yesterday the normal mode basis is always going to be a good basis but it may not be an eigenfunction of this particular problem so if i'm sorry it will be an eigenfunction of this particular problem but this is my zero order hamiltonian h naught which might it will just be the quadratic portion of the hamiltonian the idea is when i add v do my eigenfunctions still look like and to do this, what you have to do is you set up a Hamiltonian. You set up a matrix. And, and so you have H operate in some initial vector. And then you come along on this side, you know, draw and you calculate a matrix element. And the diagonal elements are just um, typically the energies that you have up here, if you, if you have a simple cubic problem or something like that. And then, then you can get some extra coupling terms. These are the ones that we care about. So how, how how can one calculate these? So basically, when one is solving the shorter equation, all one really mostly wants to do is be able to calculate this. We could calculate this to solve the problem. This part is typically easy, so this is the hard part. 
And, and the reason we were suffering so much before is we were trying to write this as cubic, quartic, and we're getting these high order polynomials, and this becomes a multi dimensional integral. The reason people love the Taylor series is because the Taylor series is written in a product form. And if these are written in product forms, one can do the trick that I showed you last time. When I took that x1, x2 squared coupling, and I had a two-dimensional integral, and I broke it into two one-dimensional integrals. You always want to do that. And that's what people do with Taylor series expansions. Here's another approach. It's based on quadrature. The, the basic idea here is that any integral, where this is some um, weight function, and this is something we're trying to integrate, any kind of integration, you can always do it by writing down points and weights. And the very simplest of these is the trapezoidal rule. So one can do the trapezoidal rule to do integration, but there are tons of other ways of doing it. And this has given rise to this particular set of functions that are very popular. This is called the sink DVI. Carl uses it, I use it, um, John Light and, and Zlatko Bacic popularized this idea. Basically, you have a sine function over a linear function. And, and if, you, if I plot this for you, get, the, get this. And so basically, I have an equal set of points. And they're separated by delta. And at each point, centered about each point, so this is centered around the origin, I'm plotting for you this particular function. And if you, if you spend some time thinking about this function, it's kind of hard to do it on the fly here. One of the things that happens with this particular function is it has some value here that's non-zero. And then at every other value of x in, this function is zero. So here's a point, here's a point, here's a point. Everywhere else, it's zero. So what happens is, when you have two of these functions, if you're thinking of doing a quadrature based on an equal set of points, everywhere this is non-zero, this function is zero. And, and that has a great simplicity because when, when you go and you do this quadrature, one of the things that happens is the only time when I'm doing this particular quadrature, the only time that this term is non-zero is for the x in point. The only time this is non-zero is, is for the case where j is equal to m. And this is just going to be equal, the value of the potential at that point. And so what happens is you get a diagonal potential, and, and the matrix element is just the value of the potential at that point. So you get a very simple way of doing integration because your, your potential is diagonal and you just get the values of the points. And then this is an integral that you only have to do once. You're taking the derivative of the sink function and then your second derivative. So this is how you calculate the potential integral, the, the, the kinetic integral matrix elements. This M is a mass, that's an index. And but once you've calculated this, you store it, and it's always going to be the same, because the sink functions are always the same. And Bill Miller, you know, somebody else calculated it before Bill Miller, but Bill Miller, because he, Bill Miller made it famous, and this is, an, this is a key equation that he uses. And so this is a very simple matrix element from doing that in it. Let me show you how it works. Here's a simple harmonic oscillator. So I'm doing a simple harmonic oscillator, and we know that the energy levels of this oscillator, because the frequency is one, is just a half, three halves, five halves. And you can see that over here, I've used five points. One, two, three, four, five. And here I'm plotting the, the, here I'm plotting the ground state wave function. And here I'm plotting the excited state wave function, e equals one. And you can see I'm not doing so well. So in a calculation, you increase the number of points and you're doing better, and you increase the number of points. And see, by the time you get to 12 points, even though these functions may not look so good, and, and I no longer did the ground state, I put an excited state in here because it's a little bit more interesting. You can see that we're getting great accuracy by just doing this 12-point calculation. 
If I go to 20, what do you think? Does it get better? No, particularly three, four, and five. Good oil increase? You're right. I think I didn't quite hear you, but you were right. Um, one of the things you see here is my, my grid went from minus four to four. And the wave function isn't quite going to zero by the time I get over here. So if I just increase the grid a bit, then that works brilliantly. So this DVR is a really powerful thing. And again, in, this, in the sense that this is a tutorial, I want to just show you a, a simple MATLAB program, how one does, how one does these calculations, because this is, this is like the heart of all these calculations. Basically, you set up the grid points, you set up the kinetic energy in the DVR, so you take that Miller formula and you program it, then you set up the full Hamiltonian, you diagonalize the Hamiltonian, and then you plot the lowest wave function. And I showed you those plots. So here's how it works. You say, I want 20 points. You pick your grid spacing over here. And I, here are all of my points. And the spacing between the points is just the difference between second and first, second and first point. And then my potential is just a grid. And so you could have put a Morse potential in here. You could put any complicated potential you want in here. But because I wanted something that was simple to show, I just picked this particular form. The next thing is you set up the kinetic energy. This is just the Miller equation that I have written out and calculated in MATLAB. You then set up the Hamiltonian. And so it's a matrix. And, and the, the, here are the kinetic terms. They only depend on the difference between I and J. So these are the, this is the kinetic energy operator that I'm setting up. And then I just add the diagonal part, which is the potential. And, and this is a kinetic part that's along the diagonal. So this is setting up my Hamiltonian. And then you diagonalize it. Every software has a way of diagonalizing these things. And then when I plot my wave functions, my wave functions are just what I get out of the, the um, when I diagonalize the matrix, the unitary transformation, this is U. And I, if I just plot the fifth column, I get the fifth wave function. So all I'm plotting in those plots that I showed you are the results of the similarity transformation, because when I'm plotting a wave function, these wave functions are zero at all of the points except one. So it makes it really easy to plot these wave functions. And that's it. So that's what Jeremiah does. He does that very simple um, DVR calculation. And he, he does it, um, I'll, I'll show you how he extends it to more degrees of freedom. Um, but he's going to apply it to, to this particular system. And Notice here's, here's, here's the Hamiltonian that he's using in normal coordinates. He likes to have a mass factor. You don't need that mass factor. Um, but he, you, he, these are the coordinates he's using. And the, the potential is what we've been talking about. He's going to do these grids that we've talked about and have one body and two body and three body. And I'll show you how we're going to calculate the Hamiltonian in just a second. And I just want to point out that here is the Hamiltonian internal coordinates for a triatomic. And people have them for tetraatomics. I've published one on a pentatomic. People used to really worry and think a lot about these kinds of Hamiltonians. Because if you want to calculate all the energy levels and your molecules small, many of these terms are important and you need to include them if you want super high resolution. So if you're John Tennyson, and you want to be able to really pinpoint all the energy levels of water, you have to use Hamiltonians of very, very high, fairly complicated. Psi is well aware of it. Um, but when you go to big molecules, you get to pick this as your kinetic energy operator. And it's because you're doing the normal coordinates. And, and the normal coordinates are going in straight line paths. So let me show you how you set up the calculation. And I'm going to assume n is equal to 3. So we have a Hamiltonian, and we just need to evaluate it. The kinetic energy, as you can see right here, is a sum of three terms. And I just write them as T1 plus T2 plus T3. And, and he's going to take advantage that you can write this as a product form. So this particular term doesn't have any dependence on the second and third degrees of freedom. 
So you get these Kronecker deltas. And you just have to have this matrix element, which is just a vanilla matrix element, times Kronecker deltas. And then for mode two, you just do it for mode two. And then for mode three, you do it for mode three. And so this is a super easy way of writing down all of these matrix elements. Ignore the plus sign. And then you do the potential. And all you have to do is have a grid of points. So this, this would be a three body term. And as long as you go and calculate the potential at a grid of these points, and these grids, grid points go far enough away, you've done the calculation. So it makes it very straightforward to do these calculations. And, and there's no Taylor series expansions. You have um, an accurate representation of the potential because you're using a grid. So all you worry about are my points close enough together, do I have enough of them, and do they expand a big enough space? So that's critical to these calculations. One of the things that happens is you often get a Hamiltonian that's really big. So I'm going to spend another couple of minutes talking about the lengths of those Because this matrix, to diagonalize, it goes as n cubed. And so every time you have another degree of freedom, your, your calculation can go a thousand times slower or something like that. So no one actually diagonalizes Hamiltonians in. Well, some people do, sometimes I do. But it turns out there's a much better way. And it has to do with the fact that one can simply do a few steps of matrix multiplication. So one thing is to find the eigenvalues of this. Another thing is to do matrix multiplication. That's a very simple process. So one can always have a matrix here multiplying by a vector to give me a new vector. So I represent that here. And then what you do in this Langstroth method that people love to use is this new vector, you're going to make it orthogonal to the C vector. So these are vectors. You can see that this simple formula, um, it's intrinsically obvious that if I take C dot D, I'll get C dot D, is equal to c dot d minus d dot c. And then here I'm going to get a c dot c. So this just goes, this will be d dot c minus d dot c, and I'll get zero. As, as when, I, when I come along and do the c dot. So c and d are orthogonal vectors. You then come along and you have h operate on d. Now e has three components. One, when H operated on D, it takes you back to C. So you get that component. When H operates on D, you get some of D back. And there'll be, this time, there'll be a third component. And we just make sure that that component, the new component, E, is a orthogonal to C and D. That's, that's, the, that's the whole part of this whole algorithm. And you keep redoing this over and over and over. And when you get done, you get something that's known as a tri-diagonal matrix. And so here was my, you know, this might be, this was based on my initial vector. And basically that vector is coupled to this vector, this vector is coupled to this vector, this vector is coupled to this vector, this vector is coupled to this one. And so because it has this long tri-diagonal form, you should be getting a better and better description of this. And so people spend a lot of time on the Langstroth method. And, and one of the things that's really important to make this fast is that when you do matrix times a vector multiplication, the more zeros over here, the faster you can make this process. So these sparse matrix techniques allow you to do matrix vector multiplication very fast. And so sparse matrices are what you get from those equations I showed you on the previous transparency. Whenever you see all these Kronecker delta functions, that means that there's lots of zeros in your matrices. And so all one has to do is, is do this Langstroth method, and one can calculate many um, states. The master of this method is Tucker Carrington, and, and Tucker Carrington has been, has been doing this for years, and here he's looking at some complex molecule. And what makes Tucker's work um, particularly impressive is he wants to calculate all of the eigenstates. So he doesn't get the very high energies. He doesn't get the very big molecules. Um, but he's pushed these methods more than anybody else. And he's using Hamiltonians like that ugly one that I showed you. And so if you want to learn more about the Langstroth algorithm, Tucker Carrington has lots of really beautiful papers. So here's a recap. 
the goal was to calculate spectra that look like this. The way you do that is you have some initial state, here's the NH dash, and you think about the states that it might be coupled to. And in this case, there were some bending states. And then, then what you have to do is once you think you know those states, you have to calculate a Hamiltonian. And to calculate the Hamiltonian, you can use a DVR type representation, and then you have to go calculate the potential. You do these grids and you do a DVR calculation, and then you combine it with Langsos. And basically what that is allowing you to do is basically this is describing how this guy is coupled to all these guys and how all of these guys are coupled. And then that Langsos method lets you go from to the arrow, from what you do is you get the eigenstates. And then, then the spectrum in this particular way I'm drawing it is just basically if you have a bright state, the spectrum is how much bright character each eigenstate has. And that's the kind of information you get out when you do a matrix diagonalization. And that lets you produce that spectrum. So that's, that's basically what Gerald I did when he did this particular calculation. And he's showing you there is a bright state that's one in each stretch. And that's another bright state over there. And so those are the bright states. All those little dots over there are the dark states that he thinks are important. Those are all those states. And, and then you calculate these grids and you do the DVR and line switch. Now I'm going to show you um, a more hand waving approach. And, and this is um, my own research. And I'm going to be trying to describe instead of NH stretches, CH stretches. And I'm not going to be aiming for the same level of accuracy as Gerlach. I'm just putting this as a, it's an interesting contrast. But you will see that all of the same basic ideas are present in my work. And, and so we're all borrowing from each other. And we, there's a lot of synergy in this field. So there is a CH2 scissor mode that's around 1450. There's a CH symmetric stretch mode around 2960. And there's a CH asymmetric stretch at 2980. And in this particular area, um, Herb Strauss was the guy who really started thinking about this first, looking at alkenes and nickels. Um, it even goes back earlier than that. And, and the idea is that, well, okay, if you run a Gaussian calculation, you get a peak down here, and it basically corresponds to the excitation of this. And then both of these modes carry oscillator strength. So you get a peak here, and you get a peak here. But that's not the end of the story, because there is this dark state, that scissor overtone, that could be in Fermi resonance. And, and here's a picture of what you might think. You know, what happens is, it turns out only the symmetric stretch couples to the scissor are symmetry. So that's, you know, symmetry can make some of these terms go to zero. And, and so you get this coupling term. And so what happens is this state can couple to this state. And the size of the coupling is over here. And what I'm going to show you is if this is something that um, Martin Quack would have done, basically, I'm just going to increase W. I'm going to keep these three elements the same in my matrix. And I'm just I'm going to keep these three elements the same. And I'm just going to increase W and show you what happens. What you see is that these two states, they start to repel each other. That's why they're separating. And you get intensity sharing. So in a simple two-state model, the, the key aspect of understanding what happens when you have this family coupling is you get repulsion and level sharing and, and intensity sharing. So one could imagine that if you're doing big molecules, and I'm, I'm, my molecules are quite a bit bigger than, than Gerlai, so I can't do his methods because they're just, my molecules are too big that I'll be talking about. What one could imagine is that you will calculate these with a really simple level of theory. I'll use density function. I've used them all. But, um, it doesn't make too much difference which functional you use for the stuff I'm doing. But basically, you calculate all of these quantities with DFT. And then the idea is that 
okay, you, you scale them. And here's some scaling factors. So I'm gonna scale my stretches. Here I'm gonna scale my bend. And I'm gonna scale my Fermi couplings. Now, people, whenever they do DFT, because it's not good enough to really get spectroscopic results, they always have to scale their answers. They have to multiply it by some multiplicative factor. And basically, I'm stepping back. If I, if I pick all of these and get the spectra fit, I'm sort of cheating because I'm going to do a great job because I've determined all these factors. But my idea was that I could use the same factors for a bunch of different species. So X and Y will change the details, but I, and hopefully the density functional theory will pick up those details. But if I could use the same scaling, then this method will work. Now, this is the normal mode type representation. So there's no coupling between the symmetric and asymmetric stretches. But if I go back to that very first transparency that I showed you, if I go back to a local mode representation, where here's one CA stretch and here's the other CA stretch and theta is some negative number that allows me to talk about the coupling between those two CA stretches, then the Fermi coupling, I will see that each CH is equally coupled to, um, over time. So that's why this number and this number are going to be the same. That local representation is really important because here are the kinds of molecules that I'm looking at. And, and one of the things that happens in molecules like this is you have many, many scissor modes. And all of those scissors, um, you know, they're complicated linear combinations of the local line scissor modes. And, and as I change from one molecule to another, and I keep adding some little functional group, because these normal modes are so sensitive to the details of the potential, my normal modes change dramatically with the precise linear combinations that you were seeing when I went, um, when I'm showing you all these complicated vibrations, um, they change, then my cubic terms are also going to change because those are the cubic terms with respect the normal coordinates. But if I pick coordinates that look like this, basically all I'm going to do, I'm not, these aren't true internal coordinates. I'm just doing a transformation of my normal coordinates to get a maximum overlap with these localized coordinates. Then what happens is you get very simple Hamiltonians. And so we've applied this to like all the molecules, the molecule I showed you in that previous transparency. But here's the basic idea. What one does is a normal mode calculation. So you get out Gaussian, you say calculate the normal modes, and basically you'll get out a bunch of frequencies. What we then do is, and I'm not the only one who does this, we you do local modes by taking the appropriate linear combination of your normal coordinates. And then what happens is these things all become localized and, and you introduce couplings. This is that quadratic, this was that G, one, two, or X, Y coupling in the very first uh, third transparency, you introduce this coupling back into the system. And, and then this guy's sitting out by himself. We then do scaling. And basically, we have developed the scaling now for all CH stretches. And so um, my student, Danny Tabor, figured out these scaling factors, and we don't change them anymore. But in this initial work, we were still working around trying to change. You then add anharmonicity. So you, you calculate these things and you scale them. One of the things we found out is we always got the same answer here and, and that the anharmonicity was the same for all these different systems to a good approximation. And so what we did is we picked some model systems, we calculated these anharmonicities, and then we just add them after the fact. And so we never do a anharmonic calculation once we've set up the model. You only have to do the normal mode calculation here, and then you scale these diagonal frequencies. And then you add on these pre-calculated terms. And here are some pre-calculated terms. Some of these are like really important Fermi resonant type coupling terms in a potential representation. These are, these are force constant elements. And, and these are in wave numbers. And so I'm looking at a wide range of molecules. And basically, you can see these numbers are almost always the same. So this is the most important coupling that leads to that Fermi coupling. And if I do a, a you know, very high level calculation, 
it just hasn't changed the numbers very much. And, and so one doesn't have to keep recalculating this number over and over and over. You can just assume that it's going to stay the same. To make these experiments, make this my theory work, I have to be able to have a really good experimentalist. And all of my work is with Tim Weir, and this he's done with Christian Mueller. And he did this when he was at Purdue. And this is a beautiful experiment. And, and so all of the molecules we look at will have a phenyl group. And the phenyl group has a S0 to a D0 transition. So basically, if you do a two photon excitation to produce an ion. If your molecule is an ion to begin with, you're all set and ready to go. But if you're interested in neutral molecules and you want to use that mass tech technique, you have to produce an ion. So basically, you have a two photon experiment that's producing the ion. And then the idea is you're going to have this laser down here. And if this laser is off resonant, then it doesn't have any effect on this two, two photon experiment. So what you're doing is you're measuring the arrival of your photons in the, I'm sorry, you're measuring the arrival of ions at your detector as you keep doing this two photon excitation. But if you proceed it with an IR laser pulse, and this IR removes population from the ground state, then there are fewer ground state molecules that can then absorb two photons and, and fall apart. So what happens is you get these dips in the collection of your ions. And if you take the difference between those two spectra, you get Tim's weird beautiful spectra. And the amazing thing about this, if you have two conformers of a molecule, this particular transition is slightly different for those two molecules. And so by this laser, if you are sitting on the zero to zero transition for one particular conformer, you can then tune this and get a vibrational spectrum. So you could do conformer specific spectroscopy. And that's the reason we were able to make all of this succeed, because I had him to help me. And let me show you the class of molecules that we looked at first. Um, Ned, the, Ned, uh, there is a question by Vatsal again. Vatsal, could you unmute yourself? Yeah. So, uh, actually, so can you please go to the previous slide um, before the spectrum? Uh, no, before this, yeah, this. So here, um, so what was the uh, purpose of scaling up those uh, diagonals? I I could not understand. Of scaling of scaling these numbers right here. Yes, 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 yes. It's, it's you know in, in density functional theory, what they always do is is they say, well, do a normal mode calculation and then multiply all of your frequencies by 0.975. And the person who, you know, what somebody did um, in some incredibly highly cited paper is they did a, they picked a density functional um, and a basis set. And they did thousands of calculations, and calculated the normal modes of lots of molecules. And they saw that there were systematic discrepancies. And then they realized that, oh, what we could do is have a scaling factor. What we'll do is we'll multiply our results um, by some scaling factor so that it agrees with experiment. What I'm doing is saying, okay, you, you can do that, but what if you just are interested in CH stretches and Fermi couplings and are trying to understand this region of the spectrum that's always been so complicated because of this Fermi resonance? Um, what I should be able to do is pick scaling factors, just like they do in density functional theory, but mine will be specific for this particular problem, for just CA stretches and scissors. And so I should be able to do better than, uh, you know, somebody who's come up with a scaling by running a thousand generic molecules. I'm, my method won't be anywhere near as general, but for this class of problems, by having these scalings, what I could do is calculation that's just okay because it's density functional theory and isn't going to get the right force constants. Um, but as long as it's systematically off, I can multiply those results by some number and get a better result. Did that uh, answer your question? Okay. And yes, yes, yes. And I, I, I have one more question in the spectrum that you showed. 
so you said for different confirmers the uh, energy electronic energy levels will be different so why is that so oh that's that's a really good question <clears throat> and so you could imagine it it just turns out that if i'm in the ground electronic state here and i and i excite a photon to the first excited electronic state that that transition will be slightly different for these two species because you know that that electronic transition is depending on basically depends on what the electrons are doing here what the electrons are doing there and they're in different environments here and here and so if i'm just trying to go from the ground state of ground state to the excited state of this molecule i will get a slightly different result than for this state now when you do it for this molecule versus this molecule those differences might be um 100 a thousand wave numbers because you really get a big difference and and here we're talking about different confirmers and so the difference might be 10 wave numbers but that is enough in these experiments that subtle difference is what allows you to do this mm, okay thank you Ned, I have a question here. Sure. Uh, you see, the explanation that you gave was some experimental groups have been arbitrarily using the scaling factor to match the observed frequencies. And that is precisely for take care of the enharmonicity which exists in the real system, which the harmonic approximation does not produce. But when you are explicitly adding the harmonic and harmonicity, why do you need to have these arbitrary scaling factors? Yes, yeah, so that's 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 a great question. And and you know, one of the questions people often ask are in the scaling factors, are the scaling factors um, including the effects of anharmonicity? And the answer is yes. But are they also including the effects that you're using a just an okay level of theory? And, and so even if I take these results, but if I take the density functional results and I try to calculate these anharmonicities and, and actually then do a high level calculation and then check and see how well they're doing, I get the wrong answer. So even if I take the density functional and, and, and do a high level theory for a small molecule, I don't do very well. And so there, the problem is there's two sources of error. One is the first one you mentioned, that the anharmonicity. And for the CH stretches, it's the bigger contribution. But there's also the fact that you're using a, just an okay level of theory, which is- yeah. you know, so, 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 I mean, I have been, I've been in this, this business for some time now. And the, the thing is that um, I have tried to do the anharmonic, what is available on Gaussian, the anharmonic calculations those uh, do not exactly reproduce. There Still, there is a difference between the observed frequencies and the and harmonic frequencies computed by the Gaussian. So uh, I'm an experimentalist. I don't uh, get in too much into theory. So that is why the, precisely the question I asked you, that when you are adding explicitly the anharmonicity by various uh, theoretical techniques, why do you still need to at the scaling factor. So your answer is, I understand that even when you do that, you don't get the exact agreement. So therefore you need to add the scaling factors, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, you stated okay. that perfectly. Okay, thank you. So here, let's start with this particular molecule. Notice, each of these CH stretches has the exact same environment. So in my local representation, this is what you get. There are four CH stretches. You know, that's, I'm gonna multiply that some multiplicative factor. Here is the coupling between the two CHs that are on the same carbon. Notice they're the same. And then you get couplings between one CH2 group and another CH2 group. That's what those couplings are. So these are the, the CH CHs. And then over here, I have, this is a scissor overtone, 
This is a scissor combination band, and this is a scissor overtone. So I put two quanta in one of these local scissors. This is where I have one quanta in each, and this is when I have um, two quanta in the other local scissor. And there's some small coupling because I'm using this internal coordinate representation. And these aren't the same energy because I, I added an anharmonic correction term that shifts. And then here are the Ws, 21 wave numbers here, 21 wave numbers here. So this particular scissor is coupled to the CH that makes one half of it and the CH that makes the other half of it. So it has this very simple form. Now, if I ignore these terms, the 21 wave number terms, that's the, the anharmonic coupling, then I'm just left with the normal modes. And, and my approach, because I'm using the same dipoles that one would use in Gaussian, I don't change that. If I just diagonalize, if I set these to zero and I turn off my scalings, I get the same results as density function. Um, if I have the scalings, they will be shifted. But, but what, what you get when you do a normal mode calculation is you get four CA stretches. And because normal modes have the symmetry of the Hamiltonian, you get this beautiful picture here. And then these are the brightness of the states. Only two of the normal modes carry brightness because you have this UG symmetry. So you get four normal modes. And you would expect to see in the spectrum one bright state and another bright state. You can actually see you see three. What happens is there is this scissor state here. And the scissor state, because it is coupled by that 21 wave numbers, leads to repulsion and intensity sharing. This level gets pushed up, this one gets pushed down. And that's why this spectra and this spectra are, you know, this, this is why the spectra has this particular shape. It is this 21 wave numbers that has caused this guy to borrow intensity from this state. And, and, and this looks astoundingly good. And that's because I, in my first effort at this, I used this molecule to, to determine the scalings. So I picked my A's and B's and C's to make this particular molecule work. But then I try the other conformer. And you can see this vector is much richer and it has this point here. And, and what's happening in this particular molecule is, is this picture gets distorted into this picture. And then these two levels get pushed up here. And so you get four levels up here. And then this, this should be a doublet. I'm only getting a singlet. But, you know, remember, there's thousands and thousands of states, tremendously complex dynamics. What we're trying to do is just capture the low medium resolution spectrum and get the short time dynamics. And and so these states are surely coupled to many other states, but we're hoping that our we're, the coupling is not too strong, and that by having scaled these things, it'll work. If I go to these species, my time is running out, so I'm getting close to the end. The spectra look completely different. So this is analogous to this, but I've just added the oxygen. All I've done is thrown oxygens in, made them ethoxies. And this spectrum turns into this spectrum. This spectrum turns into this spectrum. Let me just explain why. In the normal mode picture, everything is the same. What has happened is that the scissor mode, the dark state, has gone from being here to way up here. And so basically, the normal mode result is pretty good. And you just see a tiny little piece of the scissor overtone way up. Likewise, in this particular picture, what happens is these levels get pushed up, that level gets pushed down a bit, it's a bit more complicated, but that's why you get this three sets of triplets. So this is a nice, very, it's a very simple model, and it requires very little work. And you know, if I had another week, I could just keep going on and on about this stuff. Let me just say three problems where we've solved this. Um, here, we asked, where does the sodium ion go when you add it to a cyclohexane? And it turns out it doesn't go where you might expect. And by looking at the vibrational spectroscopy of these guys, we were able to figure that out. If we mix seven water molecules around a benzene molecule, how do the water molecules arrange themselves? So here's, here's where we apply this theory to water and, and benzene. With Tim's Weir, everything has to have a benzene in it. <clears throat> and that's the structure that we believe is the correct structure. 
And basically in this theory for when we apply it to waters, we get these local water thermal components. So each of these are color coded and every water has its own little matrix. All of these water molecules are coupled to each other. And, and this is my Fermi coupling. The very simple model for the Fermi coupling. And notice that typically the Fermi coupled in water is off resonance for most environments of this molecule. But for some environments, you get strong Fermi couplings. Actually, it's this one right here. You can get a very strong Fermi coupling. And you can see that now, because of the strong hydrogen bonding, one of your OA stretches has fallen very low in energy. And so here is an example of a result of our model. And this is the experiment that Tim Weir did. And the beauty of these compared to regular water clusters is that you're asking, where does the water go? you've broken all of the symmetry. So all of the transitions become observable and we get pretty good resolution. And we can start to break down and think about where all of these lines are coming from, some simpler versions of the molecule, some that include Fermi resonances, some that don't. And we can really sort of disentangle where all of the key couplings are coming from and where all the lines are coming from. And then finally, <clears throat> how long does the tail of a cycle of a alkyl benzene molecule have to be before it bends back on itself. And so this is a case where you have all trans, or when, did, you know, when does it bend back? It turns out this is important for combustion for some reason that we don't understand. Based on energetics, you might expect this because things like to be trans versus gauche. But if you add two, um, three gauche kinks, one, I think one, two, and three, then what happens is the chain bends back on itself and dispersion and come into play. So you could increase dispersion. And it turns out when you get to eight atoms, the molecule returns to its regular configuration. So I'm done now. Um, okay. I, I introduced a very simple model and I, I talked about how one could then extend it to more complex systems. I briefly mentioned some of the things we did, but you can see that it's still, you're looking for what are the zero order states, what are the couplings? What's the easiest way to represent those couplings? And in my work, I need to work with lots of experimentalists and sort of a long list of experimental collaborators. And it turns out lots, some of these research groups need lots of students. Um, the person who deserves the most credit, looking for Danny Tabor over here, I don't see him, it's Danny Tabor. He's, he really made, he came from John, Stanton's group, John was at Texas, and he came to me, and he just was amazing. He did tons of stuff, and now he's a young professor at uh, Texas a and wrote a review Great. article on lots of these ideas. She actually asked me to put up that reference. All right. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Ned. Big round of applause for Ned. Thank you, thank you, Ned. And I think there are already show of hands uh, for questions. So without further ado, let, let me just um, let Srihari take over. Srihari? Yeah, Ned, uh, this is really neat to see these results in the end. And I'm amazed, given the complexity of these molecules, that you're getting, you're reproducing the spectra so well. Um, yeah. Two, two quick questions. Of course, this is reminiscent. So before I ask the question, let me first add to what JD said in the beginning. Um, you know, I mean, ever since your analysis of the benzene overtone spectra with Bill Reinhardt and Casey, I think, uh, you know, we've all read those papers, the brilliant papers. It's, it's amazing that how models like that, when done built rationally could really reproduce even fairly complex or, or what seemingly complex systems. And I think the last example you're showing is sort of really reflecting that back again, that you can build these amazing models. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, that, that I, I've always been amazed by that. I mean, <clears throat> I mean that, that is sort of really magical to see this happen. But of course, it also tells us, I guess, this point that molecules, as I was telling yesterday, the molecules are not really random things and there's this locality of couplings, which really, if you can get that right, then you can build these little matrices and really put them together. So that's, uh, that's amazing. So, yeah, so, um, so thanks, that was a wonderful talk. So I'll ask my 
two quick questions now. So one is, uh, in the full spectrum that you compared to Tim Zwire's uh, spectrum right towards the end, um, how did you add in the widths? Because your, your, your Hamiltonian is going to give you only the sticks, right? I add in the widths to make the picture look good. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. And let me just, can I, I want to just quickly state one thing that what's amazing is he, this is one conformer, that's the other conformer. No one can do these experiments where you take these, these things are into converting on a fast time scale. And so anyone else who took the spectra would get a linear combination of these two. Right. I would have never been able to come up with a simple model if I had to start with some messy linear combination of these two, it's because he could give me this spectra and then this spectra, I'm like, oh. So having a good experimentalist is just critical. Yeah, yeah, of course, that's always true. Uh, <laughs> completely agree, completely agree, I think. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point. It's, I think it's both ways. You, the, 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 what you do, Ned, is you understand the experiment so well, that's how you can sort of reproduce it. And for the experimentalists also, they have to under appreciate that they need to think about the, 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 the kind of measurements they're doing, whether it's coming from one population or an ensemble or a different pop, different, you know, combination of populations. And that's very hard in condensed phase. In this case, it's, it's, it's done beautifully by Joy's lab. Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess my second Second question really goes back a little ways back into your uh, talk today, which we were talking about uh, getting these higher order potential cubic and quartic and higher order terms. Uh, I mean, as you know, I mean, there's this really, really interesting and of course quite uh, successful scaling theory that Martin Rubler has on these uh, higher order potential couplings, right? Um, which is of course quite interesting. He's tried it on a whole bunch of but fairly large molecules, uh, the scaling theory. So is that, is that, so it, it, could, could we actually use that to build the small matrices? I mean, have you ever sort of contemplated that? Um, you know, I just published a paper in JCP with Martin Grubel. Uh-huh, yes. And Using his models, we tried to use Van Vleck perturbation theory to sort of get simpler models. Mm -hmm. It was partially successful. Ah, okay. You know, it turns out, especially because he's always putting randomness into his, his models, you know, he wants to be able to generate ensembles mm -hmm. of molecules and every, every ensemble is different. So he picks something that's like a model of, you know, one of his favorite molecules and then generates all these ensembles with these cubic and quarter couplings with their scalings. And so this, this idea of locality and um, some of that, that goes away in his, his models. The ones I've seen, the ones I've worked with him are relatively small molecules with just like five or six degrees of freedom. Right. And so everything is connected to everything else. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting to think about Doing, doing his theories in a more localized representation where one knows that these couplings die off on, on certain length scales. Right. Um, we, I, yeah, those are great questions and I, haven't, I don't have a clear answer yet. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks, Sherry. Um, uh, Ravi Kishore, please unmute yourself. And I would also request Jerlai, if Jerlai can hear us, Jerlai, could you at least show us your face on the video? Uh, yeah, Ned, I, I don't know how to thank you enough. Uh, no, I wish I, I could pass you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you hear I'm you at know. home. And, uh, I, I'm in my pajamas. So this is not a good time. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's nearly midnight in Taiwan, but uh, I stay fully awake. The only thing I, so honestly, I, I start off doing this business when, when I was sitting in one of the next uh, le lecture at the OSU meeting. And I had the same question as many people do. How, what's the magic of the scaling factor? And I think that remained the center of uh, the discussion today. So, but 
I have to say, I have to correct one, one thing in Ned's talk. He said the ideas are mutually borrowing, but from what I see is always one way. I dig into the, the what, what Ned has said, and, you know, we borrow the ideas. I, I haven't seen the feedback from our side to Ned's. That's my only <laughs> comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jerlai. Thank you for the comments. Thank you for joining. Yeah. You know, when you give a talk, you normally you, you, you would, I would have seen Jerlai there and I'd know that he was in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great. Okay. So Ravi, Ravi Kishore, please. Uh, Ned, very nice talk. So I have a couple of questions. So this uh, benzene water uh, system which you talked about, so where you have seven water molecules, uh, what, what is the structure if you don't have the benzene? That's the first question. Say, what's that question again? Suppose uh, you don't uh, have benzene. What is the structure of the Ravi, water? Ravi, just shout a bit because the volume is a bit low. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so in a benzene water system where you have seven water molecules, I could see that each water molecule is coordinated or bonded with others okay, by only three bonds. Generally, water uh, is uh, like can accept uh, two... Uh, Two hydrogen bonds and do, okay, two acceptors and two donors, right? But in your structures, I see only three interactions for each water molecule. So what? Why is it so? Is it uh, unique to gas phase or something like that? Another question is, what is the structure of the water molecule without the benzene? What was that last question? What is the structure? Or how the structure of the water cluster without the benzene. Structure of the water cluster without the benzene. Is there something that is not? You know, I, I believe if the, um, the... It's very interesting. Basically, for smaller water clusters, you um, the water wants to avoid the, the benzene ring, and it just forms rings. Most of them are cyclic structures until it gets to be pretty big, and then it slowly gets to be more complicated. This, I, I believe, the cubic structure is one of the low energy structures of, of water, um, where the benzene would be replaced by water. So here, this is basically a cubic structure, and and you're right that you know you only see three interactions, and and that that is because of the geometrical constraints placed on these small water clusters. This, you know, this. It is, is it a gas, gas phase constraint for these kind of Yeah. Okay. Ned, can I add to that? Yes, please. Yeah, I think the, uh, uh, Rick Sekeli has done this uh, water clusters up to large number and where he shows that after water five, it starts to become two dimensional, I mean, three dimensional. And yes. water eight is actually cubic. If you take the benzene out of this, it will. Yes, yes, that's right. Yes. That will form Absolutely. the water one. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for pointing that out. Yep. 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 Uh, one that's more great. question. Uh, so you uh, mentioned about the CH bond being uh, useful or it can be used to deduce the structure of uh, molecules, right? Apart yes. from this, are there any other bonds which you could use? the information from it to deduce molecular structures? You know, there, that's, that's an important question. And, and a lot of people with proteins have worked on the, the, the carbonyl, C double bond O and M and stretch. Mm -hmm. and, they, um, and so basically what you want is a, a range of the spectrum where you're seeing shifts and there's some isolation. And so the mm -hmm. CO stretch is a really good one. People have tried CN stretches. They, they tried putting different functional groups in. Mm -hmm. One of the things, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of the low frequency modes that you might think might be important mm -hmm. tend to be highly delocalized. So it's, and if something's re really delocalized, it, it's somehow harder to get it to give and report back and give you useful structural information. I don't think I have it. Um, I don't. I had a specter that we, we worked on some complex system and then they actually had done the low frequency regime and it turned out very hard to get useful information. But we were always looking at, the, you know, we, <clears throat> you know, 
The C double bond O is the other one. People like Jeremiah does, you could look at the NH stretch and you could look at the OH stretch. Um, and, and those are nice isolated regions of the spectrum. And that's, so that's what you want. And that's why people tried CN, they tried OD, and they tried um, an amid one is the, the classic. Okay. okay. Thank you, Ravi Kishore. Um, I would like to move on to Jayashri. Jayashri, could you unmute yourself and ask the question? Yeah, uh, Hainan, can you go back to the slide where uh, you had the four molecules, like, which is a purple slide, I think. Um, picture of the four molecules. Um, I probably missed this, but uh, can you point out which of the CH scissors you were talking about exactly? Yes, and so, should have been more careful here. We are interested in the alkyl CH stretches. Okay. So I'm interested in one, two, three, four. So this is like an ethane. Oh, bridge. just the bridge stretch. Oh, just the bridge CH stretch. So all of these things, actually, okay. you know, these, um, there's a famous resonance in here. And somebody was telling me about this yesterday. The famous resonance in, in this phenyl group. So in isolated benzene, you have this problem. Mm -hmm. and, and Tim Lee has worked with others, um, some experimentalists. And, and what they've done is second order perturbation theory with density functional theory on, on trying to model these hydrogens, but in bigger and bigger systems like anthracene, big flat naphthalene, mm -hmm. things like this. And, and sure. they're using um, density functional theory with perturbation theory, and, and then they scale their results. And they've had pretty good success. So people have, Tim Lee has worked on looking at those CH stretches. I see. And, but, but for this, uh, these spectra are primarily with the alkyl CH stretch and bends. All my work has yeah. been um, looking at these CH stretches. And you know, it turns out they just don't couple to the femdal, but the CHs on the benzene ring, Interesting. Um, typically higher in frequency. Um, they just don't couple to these CH stretches. So any uh, so any sort of uh, dramatic effects if you you did it uh, those uh, hydrogens? Which ones? Uh, the alkene ones, the the ones you you've been looking at. Um. Because there is some symmetry here, which is going to go off, right? We have done. Um, We've done experiments. Actually, I know, obviously not true. Um, the group of Kim's Weir has done some experiments. And, and you know, you could imagine that if you were trying to develop a theory, what you would love for Kim to do is say, deuterate this one, this one, and this one. And then if all of those are deuterated, then you have one CH stretch. Herb Strauss did this a long time. You have one CH stretch. And, and so then you know the energy of that because it's become decoupled from everything else. Sure, and then you put in just the two CHs, not so easy, on this one, and, and you do a spectroscopy. So yeah, we've done lots of stuff with deuterated work. It does change all the symmetry, but in this local representation, basically it's just, basically all it does is when you, where is that picture? So you're able to pick out peaks. Okay. Basically what it does is it remove, you know, you would have to remove this guy and then it turns out that, th that these also fall out of resonance. So you just mm -hmm. get a simplification, you just are throwing away terms on the human thing. Right. But okay. We've done a lot with iteration because it's an important thing. Yeah, cool. It's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, really nice talk. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jayashree. Um, what I would uh, like is, uh, Arunan, could you unmute yourself and ask a question? Uh, thanks again Ned, for a great talk. I have no, all your work, of course, it's been on vibrational couplings. Did you ever have to worry about rotation? You know, I, I did early in my career. I wrote, Bob Field had published some beautiful mm -hmm. um, paper where he showed this incredible complexity. He did this uh, of when you made the molecule rotate faster and faster. And so, and when I was really young, I did, um, <laughs> all of these calculations and I included rotations mm -hmm. and, and they have, you could get some really cool effects in small molecules with rotations. 
the main reason i asked you this question is at times in the starting with the carbon dioxide example you have fermi resonance but you also have the coriolis interactions with vibrational angular momentum and so on yeah that's right. okay so here's this this couple things yeah i agree with that and and in small molecules they could be really important the nice thing about tim's weirs experiments is the reason they look so beautiful is because he put this in a molecular beam very mm -hmm. mm -hmm. these are beam experiments and 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 the the rotational temperature is about 17k mm -hmm. so for my big molecules i'm at 17 and the vibrations aren't at that temperature but the the rotations are at 17 around 17 he's not quite sure but in that range mm -hmm. so for these molecules because they're big and because um they're super cold it doesn't come up in any of these particular experiments at room temperature i expect it will so certainly the main main interest of see these are the systems where your models really work i'm just curious if you looked at any other molecule where they didn't really work and this could have been a reason is that a question i'm sorry yeah i was just wondering you know the examples that you show the fit look perfect i'm just wondering if you looked at any other system in which you could not explain the spectra this such a model oh. you know the <clears throat> there are some cases um nothing with nothing simple and and a lot of times it's it's when the spectra are not quite as clean or when they're multiple when you sometimes when you get multiple low energy conformers and as both experimentalists and I have a hard time um separating i've never seen i I've, i've seen um one interesting example i saw was when i had like a hinged compound that where the dipole the linear dipole approximation broke down because my molecule was big at a really low frequency motion like this mm -hmm. and and then i had to extend the model to allow the fact that as the molecule was doing this very low frequency motion my ch stretches were rocking back and forth in very large amplitude motion and i had to add a term for that mm -hmm. Okay, thanks man. For the CH stretches it's always it's always work. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you Arunan for um, joining and and asking uh, nice questions. Um I would like to take one YouTube question from Amber Jain uh who was joining us from uh, YouTube. So uh, Amber is asking keep this slide on. So Amber is really asking what do the signs of the off diagonal uh elements really mean in this uh in this fit hamiltonian parameters of a, to a single conformer this negative signs do they have a specific meaning yeah, okay they do they do yeah. but it's not it, it's a bit subtle um the reason this is negative whoops wrong button the reason this is negative it's not it, If, if you ask the source of that it would go back to the fact of, of um the fact that there's a kinetic coupling a g a kinetic coupling between these two that's always negative and there's a potential coupling that's positive and it turns out the kinetic coupling is slightly bigger so that's why that's a negative number this number also has a meaning it's positive what is interesting is this this actually goes back to my work as a graduate student one of the reasons this, this these terms are coupled is due to the fact that a pendulum when you increase its length you increase the stretch it changes the bend frequency that's with a pendulum so a pendulum just by increasing the length of a of a ca stretch you're changing the frequency of the pendulum and that's called a kinetic effect there's there's the opposite effect that when you stretch a bond 
you tend to make the force constant, the bend force constant, smaller. That wouldn't be case that that's not true in the case of the pendulum because there's no effect. There is no coupling term like that. So when you increase a, a CH stretch, there's a potential term that says we want the force constant to get smaller. That's negative. But the potential term turns out, I mean, the, the kinetic term that has to do with the pendulum and the length of the pendulum changing its bending frequency, that, that's positive. And, and so this term is mostly just a kinetic term. And there is some small potential term that is making it a little bit smaller. So there's, there's two origins to these terms. And, then, and the signs do have meanings. Right, right. Uh, thank you, Ned. Uh, Jirlai has a question. Jirlai, could you unmute yourself? Yeah, uh, Ned, uh, I, uh, so for, for a lot of the Fermi resonance that we saw, right, this coupling between the stretching fundamental and the bending of a tone, the, the negative also sensitively depends on the position of the stretchings. And I think that is probably related to what you were talking about, right? I, I, I tried to digest your early papers uh, in the 80s. And that is the impression I have, but this is too late in the evening. I can't think clearly because <laughs> you're talking about two terms and the cancellation. So I, I think because we, we studied the stretching of NH and that, that shift by a larger window. Yeah, that's right. And, and that it's, it's, it's murkier too because it all depends on your representation. And if you're using rectilinear coordinates, there, there is no kinetic. Yes, but I think at the same time, that coupling shift to, to the potential part, right? The yeah, fact right. we see it, the it consistency, it. yeah, the fact we see the consistency trend in the other coordinate system, right? It, we, we use the normal mode. So I think something yeah. common is there, so but I can't figure out exactly why. So that, that is not a question, but I mean, more like a comment. Uh, so, so something yeah, no, is general. I've seen lots of really interesting effects with these coupling terms and their magnitudes. Yes. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jim. Um, are there any further questions or clarifications or points that anybody wants to Mention from the audience. Shriari here. Can I ask? Yeah, Shriari. Shriari, please. please. Uh, uh, Ned, there was some time ago, there was this uh, paper from Brooks Pay uh, where he basically studied a whole bunch of molecules in different uh, conformers, some which were planar and some which were non planar. And he was looking at the IVR uh, in these systems and he said that they fall into kind of two classes. So you have planar conformations which show a completely different IVR time scale, they're centered around that, versus the non-planar conformations, right? I mean, these are sort of biggish molecules that Brooks was looking at. And I, I think this was published in 1999 or like early 2000s. And I have never found anybody answer that question really theoretically, at least understand why this planar versus non-planar conformations have this wide separation in the IVR lifetimes. I mean, do you think your method could actually now shed some light on this stuff now? Um, <clears throat> great question. You know, that's something I would, I would have to think pretty hard about it, probably pretty, you know, and when Brooks is always looking at these very long time scales. Right. And I just, it's, that's a good, you know, the, there's probably some symmetry, certainly the symmetry lowering would be the thing I would think about first. Right. Like all the out of plane modes are completely decoupled from the in plane modes in a, in a normal mode, zero order representation. So effectively that is greatly reducing the effective density of states. But you know, mm. I, I don't know. I haven't thought about it. And I don't know those cases. It'd be interesting to think about. Yeah, okay. Thanks. 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 Sorry, I can't enlighten you. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Shriyari. 
Thank you. Um, so I think uh, Satish. Um, yes. I, I think we are ready to conclude this session. Yep. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So 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 thank you, Ned. Thank you once again uh, for enlightening us, for giving two be beautiful talks, and I think um, uh, we have them in YouTube, and I will send you the links as well. There might be questions under those. If you um, care to look at those questions and answer them, that would be great. If not, people can email you as well. But um, uh, from Satish and, uh, and my side, I really uh, thank you for doing this for us. Um, and we also thank everyone here who ex uh, with their excitement joined uh, late in the evening from 7.30 to almost now nine, nine o'clock in the evening sitting, uh, sitting with us. And this was uh, just for the information for everybody here and Ned, you recorded the highest Zoom audience in both the talks. <laughs> so that's that's great. That's great. So 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 we had over 150 to 160 people joining over two talks. So so and and of course YouTube will be filled up for later views, but but this is great. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. And thank you for those uh, lucid explanation. And I also want to thank sincerely some of our colleagues from India, um, Sri Hari, Arunan, uh, and, and so many, so many others, Ravi Kishore, all of all of them showed excitement in these talks and discussion and really took the discussion to a great, uh, a, a very, very interesting level. So thank you all for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jyotis Mon and Satish and Ned. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Ned, we will uh, shortly send you something from our side yes. on the post. Okay, just look out for your post. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care and goodbye. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye Ned. Yeah. Bye bye, Sri Hari. Bye bye.